uh, surmised, because Jesse wasn't doing the children's sermon this morning, uh, that Jesse isn't here, and that's correct. He and his uh, wife are, and kids are on vacation, and so uh, still in, back in Vermont, but uh, still on vacation this morning. And um, as you might know, I've refused to ever do a children's sermon. <laughs> and uh, as Jesse likes to say, Brent, you're a really good assistant pastor just in specific ways, and I was like, I'll receive that, so, uh, um, but we are going to continue in our sermon series this morning in Second Peter, so if you have your Bibles or devices and want to find your way there, we're in Second Peter chapter 2, Second Peter 2, if you paid attention last week, uh, Jesse talked about false teachers, and he talked about false teachers, false prophets in the Old Testament, this morning we're going to be talking about false teachers, uh, false uh, prophets, if you will, in the New Testament, in today's time, in the modern time. So as it, as it is our custom, out of respect for God's Word, if you would, please stand if you're able. So please stand. We're going to be reading 2 Peter chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 1, and then we're going to skip the verses that we talked about last week and then jump back, jump down to verse 10. But it says this, but false prophets also rose among the people, talking about the Old Testament, just as there will be false teachers among you, talking about now, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master, that would be Jesus, who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. Their destruction is not asleep. And then jumping down to verse 10, it says, And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. They're They're bold and willful, and they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. Their hearts are trained in greed, accursed children they are. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing but was rebuked from his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. They are waterless springs and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual pleasures of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. I think I'll save the last few verses for the end of the message to read. So why don't we pray? And would you agree with my words? So Father, we um, we know that your word takes spiritual discernment. We know that your word was inspired as you moved men along by the Holy Spirit, we know that your word is given to us for correction and reproof, reproof and exhortation, rebuking, convicting. So Lord, we just uh, approach your word, Lord, with, our, with an open heart this morning, asking that you would open the eyes of our hearts to your word, to see ourselves, to see our Savior Jesus, and to see how we might be transformed, to be changed, to be applying your word to our lives. And so we 
just ask, Lord, that we might experience you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks. You may be seated. So this morning I wanted to take from those verses 1 through 3, 10 through uh, 22, those 15 verses, and, and try to package them into about four different principles. And my, my hope and my goal, I'm, I don't know if I'll be able to accomplish it fully, is to really to encompass every verse that we just read and the, the ones that we're going to read at the end of the sermon into these four principles. But let me just go ahead and share those with you. And then I'll try to delve into them and delve into unpacking them. But uh, I've entitled the sermon this morning, Principles for Discerning False Teaching, or slash, Principles for Discerning False Teachers. And so looking at 2 Peter 2, which I would say is probably the best chapter in all the Bible, arguably the book of Jude would be maybe the, the best but second to Jude only, there's four principles for us to be considering this morning. So if you could keep those up for a bit here, Carter. The four principles are, uh, number one is that there will always be false teaching and teachers. Uh, number two is false teaching or teachers can be convincing. I would add to that they can be subtle, but they can be convincing. Uh, number three is False teaching and false teacher, teachers, ultimately, they deny Christ. And then a fourth principle is false teaching and teachers. They live by the flesh and they appeal to the flesh. And so those are the principles I'd like us to consider this morning. So let me try to discuss each of, all, each of those. Number one, uh, there will always be false teaching uh, and false teachers. You know, Jesus said it. You know, after me will come uh, uh, sheep and wolves, clo or, yeah, wolves and sheep's clothing. Uh, Paul says, after he planted a church, he says, uh, after me, there's going to be fierce wolves coming in among you, uh, not trying to spare the flock. Uh, John said, Jesus' best friend John said, uh, there's false teachers, false prophets, antichrist, if you will, against Christ in the here and now, and they will continue to be. And one day, they'll be the ultimate anti-Christ. And Peter says here, uh, just as they had it in the Old Testament, for people who were so-called prophets, you're going to have that in the New Testament times. There will be, as he says, false teachers among you. You know, it is what it is. Part of living as a Christian is to have to distinguish between truth and error. And not only is it is what it is, but many people will follow after the false teachings. That's what he says. Many, verse 2, many will follow that sensuality uh, and, and follow them in their sensuality. So there will be many people to do. He elaborates later on why that happens. One is because he's appearing, uh, appealing to people's central nat natures, their instincts. And so, uh, it, it, you know, when you go and hear somebody who tells you only what you want to hear, that's easy to attract a following. If people are telling you only what you want to hear. And he also says he's going to be appealing to those who have just escaped, barely escaped, he says. In other words, new believers, people that don't have an understanding of Scripture. They don't have a foundation in the Word of God. They don't know what the Bible says, so when they hear somebody speak uh, with authority, then they're going to, to, to follow after. Verse 14, that, that was verse 18 about the barely escaped new Christians. Verse 14, he says they'll, they'll attract you know, uh, carnal people, non-Christians, if you will, uh, new Christians, those that have barely escaped, but it will also attract unsteady uh, uh, people, people who are either immature believers or oppressed believers uh, coming to hear what they want to hear. And so the, uh, the principle is that we have to be on guard because we will engage in, in our life as believers uh, of false teaching. An another principle is that false teaching, false teachers can be subtle, and they, and they can be convincing. Verse 1, it says they will 
secretly introduced. Some translations say cleverly introduced. Some translations, which I think this actually might be the best way to say it, will secretly and cleverly introduce heresies or wrong teaching or wrong beliefs. In other words, they don't come uh, proclaiming to be a false teacher. They don't wear t-shirts and say, I am a false teacher. Uh, and they don't uh, only teach false teaching. Uh, they teach true teaching, but intermingled with that, Peter seems to imply, is false teaching. They do it in a subtle way. I think Jesse used the analogy you know, a few weeks ago, sort of the terrifying you know, thought of you know, putting a frog in boiling water. You know, if you put a frog in boiling water, immediately it will jump out. But if you put a frog in water and slowly bring it to a boil, the frog will stay into that water until it obviously boils itself. And so there is that sort of sense that Peter's conveying here of how false teaching can be intermingled in a person's life and, be, and find its way into their life. At verse 3, it says, they will exploit you with their false words. In other words, they'll be convincing enough to, to have you buy their teaching and have you act upon their teaching because they're, they're convincing. Um, they're, some translations say, a charisma, charismatic, they don't use the word charismatic, they use the word uh, uh, something along that lines of uh, enticing, if you will. They're enticing in their speech. Uh, verse 18, um, they speak loud bo boast of folly, um, bloating words of folly, one translation says it. In other words, they're, they're good with words. They're, they're good with teaching. Uh, they're, they're good at saying a lot of things and saying it the right way. Uh, for example, just listen to this. Let's say I said to you this morning, for the rest of the sermon, I am going to engage in pragmatic pre-verification with the potential for oratorical articulation, which is too pleonastic to be expeditiously or comprehensively assimilated. You know what I just said? I just said I'm going to be meaningless for the rest of what I say. But, but that, that's not how I said it. Everything else I'm going to say is going to be nothing. But, but, but false teachers say a lot of things, kind of comparable to our politicians today, say a lot of things, but they mean nothing. They say nothing. And so false teachers, Peter is saying, is they, have to, they, they, they can be convincing. Uh, they can be subtle. And, and, and I think the application here, hopefully is obvious, is that if I'm going to be a believer and you know, I'm going to read Christian books and I'm going to watch Christian television and I'm going to listen to Christian radio and I'm going to go on the internet, I, you know, I have to realize everything that I hear and taught and read and listen to, I, I have to be discerning. I have to be discerning to what I'm listening to. My first pastor gave this analogy when I was a new believer, and I googled it to see if it's true, and I got mixed reviews on whether or not it's true, but he told the analogy of uh, the FBI when they're trained to spot counterfeit money. You would think, oh, they, they learn all the fake ways that money can be counterfeited. And actually, the training uh, consists not of learning all the fake types of money, but they just spend hours and hours with the real money. And so they know how to recognize the real money. So when they see or feel or touch fake money, they, they recognize it for what it is. And, and I, I think that is the principle for us. We've got to know the real word of God, the real Jesus, and that's how we recognize the counterfeit. Uh, that's what the Bereans did. Maybe you know about the Bereans, Acts chapter 17, Acts 17, uh, verses 11 and 12, says that uh, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness. Paul talking about those that he went to visit. But what did they do? They, they received the sermon, 
but then examining the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. So they listened to the sermon, but they went home and they studied the Hebrew scriptures to make sure those things were so. And many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. In in other words, uh, they studied, they discerned what was real and what was not real. And, you know, I think I can speak for Jesse who's not here. You're welcome to do that. I I can speak for a smell. Uh, Please do that. And I, I think I can speak for Sean. You better do that whenever. Just kidding, Sean. But, but what I'm saying is, uh, I'm not asking you to be gospel, the gospel Gestapo. I mean, there's things that uh, you, you know, you're going to agree with. That's part of maturing as a Christian. We'll talk about that a little bit. But there, there is a difference between, uh, between disagreeing and, and false teaching and false beliefs. And as Christians, we have to, we, we have to be discerning. You know, we have to be like the the people who study the money, you know. And I did find uh, one, uh, actually not an FBI agent, but uh, uh, it was the equivalent of that in Canada uh, who was in charge of finding counterfeit money. But she said she practiced the touch, tilt, look through, look at uh, practice of figuring out if money was counterfeit or not. Uh, She said you could touch it. And if you touched money, you, you knew the difference sometimes of the way that it felt. And in the, at least, Canadian currency, uh, you would touch it because some areas they have raised print and some areas they don't have raised print. And then she said you would tilt it. And so you, there's holographic colors in the money. And so if you turn it a certain way, you, you should be able to see those colors. And then you look through it. We do that here in America. I've seen cashiers do it. You hold it up to a light to look for the, the water lines. And then you, you look at it because... Uh, in you know the fine images and the fine prints, there's nuances that a counterfeiter really can't do with a regular printing machine, if you will. And so that, that's what we should be doing with God's Word. We should be touching it every day, tilting it, looking through it, looking at it, uh, knowing what it says. Because false teachers, they're here, and false teachers are convincing. Another principle... The third principle is that false teaching, false teachers deny Christ. You know, that's, you know, that's really probably the most important uh, way to identify a, a false teacher. They might be, they might be um, clever in how they do that. Uh, but ultimately, it's a denial of, as Peter says, they deny the master that bought them. They deny Jesus, they deny him as Lord. They deny him in, in, in some type of way. It, it reminds me of John's statement, 1 John chapter 4. This is what he says, But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. Indeed, it is already here. You know, implied here is that, you know, those that deny those important aspects of who Jesus is uh, and who Jesus was uh, are people that shouldn't be trusted. You know, if you've ever had a a conversation, and I say this respectfully, um, but if you've ever had a conversation with a Jehovah's Witness or, or a Mormon uh, it doesn't take you to very long to realize that you're both using the same words, you're using the same vocabulary, but they're using a different dictionary than the Bible and, and what the Bible says about Christ. You know, a, a Mormon would say, yeah, Jesus is God, but he was a, a man who, who became a God, a, a Jehovah's Witness with uh, say something similar, you know, Jesus was a created being. And, and both a Jehovah's Witness and a Mormon would say, hey, you know, you're, you're saved by uh, maybe believing in Jesus, but really it's about being good enough, not by Jesus alone. 
And again, you know, I'm not trying to be disrespectful um, to Jehovah's Witnesses or, uh, or to Mormons. And I, and I don't know your background, if that's like a, you know, uh, something you've never heard before. You know, I, I'm, I am trying to be respectful here. I mean, there's some Jehovah's Witnesses that I know that I like better than a lot of you. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but I am trying to say, I am trying to say that's false teaching. And it's destructive eternally destructive. And, and that's what Peter uh, was trying to say here. So, so they can, you can believe them in destructive heresies about Jesus not being God or the deity of Christ or salvation not being about faith in Jesus. But you can also deny him by him not being your master. Him not being the Lord of your life. You, you, you come to Christ as your Savior, your forgiver, but you have to come to Him as your Lord, as your leader. I, I was 20 years old, and I'd never heard that before. My, my pastor of the church I was visiting came to me, and he, he just asked that question. Have you ever received Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? And I, I'll never forget my reply. He was sitting on my, uh, even my fireplace there, and I was sitting on my couch, and I says, I think I probably received him as Savior, but I've never received him as Lord. And that initiated a conversation that led to several weeks later, me in my backyard reading an article by Billy Graham entitled, Are You Sure You Are Converted? And I got to the end of that article and I said, no, I've never been converted. I've never given my life to Christ as the forgiver and leader, the Lord of my life. And I said, Jesus saved me. And the Lord changed me drastically and came in, the Holy Spirit came and into my heart and, and changed my life. But you can deny the Lord in that way, deny him in that he is uh, the Lord of your life. I would say, in my opinion, probably the, the, one of the ways that's most common, at least in, America, in American uh, circles, at least, I, you know, I live in America, so I'm I, and maybe have most experience with American Christianity with you, if you will, is that you can deny Christ in what I would call by not emphasizing him or by not emphasizing essential things or not, or not focusing on him. You know, I uh, traveled to Louisiana. I used to drive my, that's where I grew up. My family used to live there. They've all moved since then. But when I first moved to Vermont 23 years ago, we would at least drive to Louisiana once a year, maybe twice. Um, and I'm too cheap to pay for to, you know, four kids and you know me and my wife to, to fly, so we would drug our kids, and then we would just drive <laughs> all the way to Louisiana. So I listened to a lot of radio. Uh, I, I listened to satellite radio, and there's Christian teachers all over satellite radio. And there was one, I won't name his name, you probably know who he is, but, you know, he was sort of then and now labeled as a, a false teacher. So I said, I'm going to give him a try. So for 12 hours, I was by myself this time, for 12 hours I listened nonstop to this guy, 12 hours. And so at the end of the 12 hours I was like, I'm going to just think through that. And I'm like, I, I know how to not be sad, I know how to, how to be happy. I know how to not be insecure. I, I know how to be confident now. I, I, I know how to uh, succeed or at least fa face my failures so I, so I can uh, be successful. But I don't know the, I, I don't know that I've heard the answer for my greatest need which is the forgiveness of my sins. And so, 12 hours, no gospel. And so, one of the ways that false teachers can deny the master is there's not a focus. Uh, there's not an emphasis. And another way is they take some non-essential doctrines, if you will, which 
I, I might even agree with them about what they believe about a non-essential doctrine, uh, for example. And, and, and they raise it to a level of that's all that they talk about. That's all that they preach about. There, there's no Jesus. There's no salvation. There's no the, the essential things of our, our, our faith. And so Peter makes it clear here. And I think why he's such on, on a tirade here. I mean, he kind of is on a tirade if you read, uh, if you read the, the, those verses. Is, uh, because I think he's saying, listen, you know, salvation is on, is on the line here. Salvation is on the line here. You know, uh, he, he, he talks about uh, those things. You know, I, I don't know if this is helpful to you uh, or not, but I think it's helpful. I, I think of things in sort of, uh, I'll steal a phrase from someone I heard, uh, another pastor says that when we, when we examine a sermon or examine for false teaching, we sort of had to think in what he called a theological triage. And, and what he meant by that is, he goes, there's, you know, utmost first important things up here, like, like the deity of Christ, like justification uh, by faith, uh, like the authority of Scripture. Uh, you know, th- those are non-essential, those are essentials that are non-negotiable, I should say. So when you examine a, a, a false teaching, uh, those are things that are non-negotiable. The, those, those, you know, Jesus is the way to heaven. The, those are non-negotiables. And then he says you have like a second tier and a third tier. Uh, you know, a, a third tier, for example, we, we say in our, our membership class, there's some things that we've sort of decided are non-essentials, like if you're a Calvinist or Arminian, uh, if you believe in an old earth or a young earth. Uh, I mean, we, we have a, a list of several things. And then there's sort of the, that would be a, a lower ground. Then there's sort of the middle ground, like baptism. Like, you know, there's differences of opinion. And so t- tier one is what we would call a top tier would be orthodox Christianity. The, 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 that's non-negotiable. And then you have the second tier and the third tier. And everybody's different on their second tier and third tier. tier. But we would all agree that those are born-again believers, spirit-filled believers, Bible-believing believers. And and, and in my opinion, my opinion, you know, I listen to a lot of people on the internet. They're fighting about these things down here, calling people heretics because they disagree about these other things. For the record, I don't think that's a false teacher. A false teacher is the ones who are up in this tier denying Christ. And again, they can take some things down here and that's all they talk about. So in a way, they're denying Christ. But, but Peter here is, is shepherding his people. And he's saying these are teachers who are teaching things that are antithetical to who Jesus is and antithetical antithetical to being a Christian. And so so false teachers ultimately deny Christ. And then a, a fourth principle is that false teachers or false teachings teaching appeals to the flesh or they the, the teachers live by the flesh and, and they appeal uh, to the flesh. If you read the New Testament, uh, you'll see that Paul talks a lot about, the New Testament talks about, Jesus talked about, John talked about false teachers. And if you look at church history, we know that there was plenty of false teaching going around then, like there is false teaching going around now. I, I would say there's, there's really two polar opposite reactions to the gospel. And, and what I mean by that is, the gospel, Christianity, this is what Christianity is. Christianity is that we're saved by grace through faith, not by works. We have an eternal relationship with Christ. We're going to heaven because we have put our faith in him. It's by grace through faith, not by works. And so there was, there was a, a sort of a polarized reaction to that. On one side, 
There was what Paul uses the term Judaizers or legalism, where, okay, okay, it's Jesus plus works that, that makes you a Christian. I mean, yeah, you can believe in Jesus, but you also have to do this and this and this. You also got to obey. And Paul's like, no, read the book of Galatians. No, you're saved by grace through faith. And then you have the other side of the coin, which I think is what Peter is addressing in 2 Peter 2, what, where theologians call it antinomianism, meaning that works don't matter. In other words, uh, you know, you can just sin all you want. And as my first pastor also used to say, you can sin all you want. The question is, how much do you want to sin? Because someone who's been converted, who's been born again, who's experienced the new creation in Christ, the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of them. Shall we go on sinning, Paul said? God forbid. Will we still sin? John says yes, but we confess our sins. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse for all unrighteousness. In other words, a Christian is someone who hates sin and fights sin in their life. And so Peter looks at these teachers and they go, that's not what they're teaching. And that's definitely not what they're practicing. And so they entice people and they also live that way. They, 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 you don't see much hating sin and fighting against it. Uh, they live by the flesh. Listen to this, verse 2. They follow their sensuality. Verse 3, and in their greed... Verse 10, they indulge in the lust of devouring passion. And here's the clue. They despise authority. They despise any spiritual authority in their life. And they despise the authority of the word of God. They're bold and they're willful. They do not tremble as, the, as they blaspheme the glorious ones. In other words, they're spiritually arrogant. Um, he, he says, you know, even the faithful angels, like Michael talks about in Jude they don't approach the devil, uh, the faithless angels, without saying the Lord rebuke. In other words, they're not, their spirit is not, it's, it's by God's grace they have spiritual power. And it's through the Lord, not their own power. They're spiritually arrogant. Uh, they're creatures of instinct. Uh, they pleasure, they count it pleasure to revel. In other words, to sin in the daytime. In other words, they flaunt their sins. There are blots and blemishes, reveling, enjoying their deceptions. They have full eyes full of adultery, probably meaning they're likely to commit adultery, but also spiritual adultery. They're insatiable for sin. And then they follow the way of Balaam. Maybe you know that story. We don't have time to look at it. Numbers 22 through 24. But the uh, Balaam uh, was... a, a a prophet, if you want to call him that, who didn't obey God and but was intrigued by money to give a prophecy, also invited or encouraged sexual immorality back into the nation of Israel. And, and then finally, these people are enslaved. They're enslaved to their passions. You know, what, what is freedom? Freedom is not the ability to do anything you want. Freedom is the ability to do what you ought to do. Freedom is the ability to want to do what you ought to do. And, and that's the freedom that, that, that Peter says someone who's been born again has. It's very reminiscent of Galatians 5 here, the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, anger, Strife, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We, we see false teachers appealing to the flesh and, and living to their, in their flesh. They appeal to sensuality. You know, they're, they're, they're like waterless wells, though. They're like clouds without real rain. 
They're talking about spiritually feeding you and your spiritual hunger that God put inside of you, but it doesn't work and it's not sustainable. They're creatures of instinct. I thought I'd introduce to you a couple of members of my family to help me uh, illustrate this. But this is uh, Toby and Ella. And we love Toby and Ella. We like to tell our kids, if we would have had Toby and Ella before we had kids, they wouldn't exist. <laughs> we just love Toby and Ella. Ella, the, the uh, golden one, will, literally will wake you up in the middle of the night, want you to kiss her head, and then she'll go back to sleep. She's, I, I've never seen an animal like that. It's just, just unbelievable. But if I'm really honest, Toby and Ella have about five priorities. You know what their priorities are? First of all, food. Food is their priority. Sleep. Reproduction. Toby, Toby doesn't even have the parts, but he still tries. <laughs> Ease and comfort. That, that, that's their five priorities. They're creatures of instinct. We live for something higher than that, don't we? We live for something higher than that. And I should say, I find it interesting that uh, my dogs follow my wife around everywhere if she's home. And I, even if, I, if everybody's home, they'll still follow Lori around everywhere. And they won't, they won't follow me around. They followed me around because she was out of town for two days this past week. Ella cried when she came home. You want to know why? Because Lori is a false teacher. Because <laughs> she gives them food. She gives them ease. She gives them comfort. She gives them sleep. I, I, I'm kidding. But barely. <laughs> Listen to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2. Preach the word, Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. Interesting words here about preaching. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Two out of the three are kind of negative, aren't they? Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but they'll have itching ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. It's kind of true back then, kind of true now, isn't it? I was just thinking ironically about these verses here. Uh, don't hear much about the wrath of God, which is the complement of the love of God. But, but Peter here definitely talks about some wrath, doesn't he here? They'll bring upon themselves swift destruction. Their condemnation and destruction is not asleep. They were born to be caught and destroyed. They will suffer wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. Not exactly easy to give to itch itching ears. We see it today with sexuality. God hasn't changed. God made a man and a woman, and he made the act of marriage sex for a man and a woman in marriage. And so you can find a teacher that doesn't agree with that. False teaching appeals to the flesh. And false teachers also live by the flesh. And so, so let me end with um, maybe a Big theological question here, but I'll just read verses 20 through 22. And at least when I read this, the theological question jumps out. It says, For if after they escape the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last slate has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to never have known the right name of righteousness and knowing then, then after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them, what the true proverb has said has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, 
and the sow, the pig, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. So here, here's the question. Are these teachers really Christians? Are they not really Christians? Peter seems to say here they're not Christians, but here's the question. Were, were, they, question, were they Christians and then they are not Christians? And, and that, you know, it says at the beginning in verse 2, they denied the master that bought them. And so for, for the record, how you answer that depends on your theological persuasion. I, I would answer that by saying they were never saved, but other people might answer that and say maybe, maybe they were saved and they went apostate. And so, so here, here, here's the question. Did they lose their salvation or can a person lose their salvation? It's a big question, but I thought it'd be maybe ideal to end with that. Today. And so, so here's my question about that question. If you're asking, can I lose my salvation? Can I lose my salvation? I, I, I would answer that by saying it depends on why you're asking. If you're here this morning and you say, can I lose my salvation? I love the Lord and I hate sin and I'm fighting sin in my life, then I would say to you that nothing will snatch you out of the hand of the Lord. Jesus said, nothing, those that the Father gives me, nothing can snatch them out of my hand. If you're here this morning, you say, I, I, I love the Lord, but I can't say that I'm hating sin and fighting sin in my life. I would say to you, Jesus said, if you love me, Obey my commandments. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't even think about that question. Can a Christian lose their salvation? Like, like, like that doesn't even register in your life because that's just not the way you think. That's not something that you think about. And I want to say this carefully, but that's not a good place to be. Is there anything, Jesus said, the disciple says this, John chapter 6, is there really anything more important than eternal life? Where else can we go, Jesus? You have the words of eternal life. Oh, I worry about a lot of things. Do you worry about your soul? Jesus said, worry about your soul. It's about eternal life. And that's why Peter had some strong words for us this morning. Let's pray. The band's going to come up.